to just have a day of thanksgiving, but to have a life of thanksgiving and giving you all the glory and honor. We thank you for this night. We ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for those of you that are new, this is not our normal Wednesday night service. We normally have a Bible study. But on Thanksgiving Eve, I like having a few people share testimonies. And so uh, tonight we're going to have several testimonies that are going to be shared. Then we'll end with uh, uh, some sharing out of the Word and communion. Uh, But first, let's welcome Michael and Callie. They're coming up, and I believe their beautiful daughter is coming along with them. And they're going to share what God's been doing in their life. Is that good? There we go. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Callie. This is my husband, Mike, and my daughter, Caroline. As you can hear, I am not from the West. Um, We are originally from Georgia, and we moved here from Memphis, Tennessee um, at the beginning of the year. And as I, if I'm nervous or excited, my southern drawl gets thicker, so y'all just bear with me. Um, it's been a, a little bit of a challenging year for us, but God is faithful, um, and he is a good God and an awesome God. So let me just try something with y'all for a second. When I say God is good, you say all the time. God is good, and all the time God is good. So that's, there you go. So that's one of the things that we have to think about as we go through our trials. And we went through some trials this year. Um, at, during the summer, our three-year-old daughter, Allie, who's in um, uh, Cubbies right now, um, had an accident. Um, she was just in our driveway riding on her scooter, and she broke her femur. And I don't, you know, right through through here. Um, and it was very scary. Um, when I picked her up, her leg was just dangling. I could feel it poking through in my hands. And of course, Caroline was there, and she was freaking out. So I had two screaming children in my hands, and he was at work. So that was a very... I was swimming laps at the old club, so... <laughs> anyway, uh, so that was a very scary moment. And of course, in my frustration and nervousness inside I was just dying but I told I said God please keep me together um, because I have to keep it together for my child because she's very scared and so was Allie of course Um, and he did God was faithful he helped me keep it together so I didn't freak out when I called 911 they put me on hold (laughs) so I you know kept it together a little more picked her up put her in their car seat they called me back and finally the EMT came and we just kept it together but that was a rough four weeks I don't know if any of you've ever had a child or an adult that has had a major break like that in their femur bone but they put her in a spica cast well the spica cast was from her waist up to her chest both legs all the way down with a bar in between her legs So she was like this for four weeks. Well, we had a summer trip planned back to Atlanta. I hadn't been home since last Christmas. All of our families in Georgia. Um, So that was one of the rough things dealing, you know, for us to being out here is all of our families on the East Coast. Um, But again, God is good. And all the time. That's right. He um, got us through that horrible night. We were at the hospital down there in Loma Linda, um, just working on her, and it was very scary because she had to go under, and, you know, I don't know if any of you have ever had a child in the hospital. Some of you, I'm sure, have. It's just a very scary time. But God got her through it, and I can thankfully say that today she is walking pretty much normal. She got out of that cast in four weeks. Um, It is amazing what God's creation, how he built our bodies, especially our babies, how fast they heal. And that was just an an awesome miracle for us. So we have to give God that praise and glory. Um, Also this summer... um, I got a phone call um, that I had a mammogram and I had a phone call um, that you need to come back and let's do it again. Well, we did it again and they said, well, we see something, so you're going to have to have a biopsy. Well, my mom had breast cancer. 
So that was really scary for me. But you know what? God gave me a peace and a calm over that that I knew no matter what the outcome, it was going to be just fine. It was going to be okay. But I asked God to please let me glorify you through this, whatever the outcome. And I can remember um, coming to women's Bible study, and I told Mary Lee about it, and she prayed with me, and she prayed that let's, it's just not even going to be there. And you know what? When they went in there and biopsied, it had just totally disappeared, and the flesh that they took out was, was nothing. So praise God. Yeah, that was that was awesome. But anytime we had family members calling this summer for you know whether it was uh, for Allie's leg or you know um, for what I was going through, I just I, uh, I wanted God to just use me. And please don't let me be bitter when I talk to my family on the phone. Please just. God, can you just use me and let me give you the glory? And, you know, I, I have family members that don't know the Lord and they are not walking with the Lord or they're saved but way off, you know, not walking the line. But anyway, so when we call, I just praised him and gave him the glory and said, you know what, everything's going to be fine. It's going to be okay because he is faithful and he is caring and loving and it'll be okay. And it was, and it was totally fine. So we just, we know that when we go through trials, not to be bitter, but to give him all the praise and glory and to just be joy filled, not happy, but joy filled. Um, and so that was just, just an awesome thing that God's been doing in our lives through the, through the summer. Um, the other thing that I was going to mention that, um, God has called me to homeschool, and so I'm a homeschooling mom, um, and I just want to, if anybody out there is scared about homeschooling or thinking they might want to, um, please contact me and let me know, because, you know, you think it's something that you can't do, and I had no intentions of homeschooling my children whatsoever. I thought, put them into good public school, and, you know, I'll do whatever it is I want to do, home, you know. Well, God just changed my heart, and when we were in Memphis, he called me to homeschool, and I just, I, was, I fought it for several months, but he, I believe that he put us in that place because that was such a huge homeschooling network, and it was a big thing in Memphis, and God knew he was going to have us come out here, but he knew that we had to go to Memphis first so that he could uh, set me up for the right place to start homeschooling, and I tell you, I was not a good, you know, math um, person. I was terrible at it, and I really thought, you know, I can't do this. Are you sure you want me to homeschool? Because this is a little scary. But I have to praise God. He has given me such awesome curriculum. He has guided me through, you know, all of that. Um, And Caroline is in first grade. And I have to say, I'm going to toot her horn. She's doing multiplication in first grade. So... um, Anyway, so God can use you, and if he's calling you to homeschool or something else, you know, don't shy away from it because you don't think you can do it. Because you know what? God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. So whatever it is that you are feeling the call, just go to it. Run to it, and God will bless you, and he will take care of you. So thank you. It's my husband. (laughs) Wow. Obviously, I have no chance of following that up very well. But the only thing I will say, you know, we, we've had some challenges this year. And, and as a Marine, I'm sure there's some Marines out there. I'm a planner. I always have a plan. I have a secondary and a third plan if those things don't work out. And one thing I've, I've found out during this past year, if you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plan. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what I've learned. And, and it's been a good lesson for me because I have begun to back up a little bit and just rely on faith. And I think that's the biggest thing. I'm thankful for those opportunities just to rely on faith. That's all I have. Thanks, guys. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for serving our country. And uh, they're just a, a great couple. So thank you. God bless you. And they also serve here in our Awanas, and uh, so that's very wonderful, and that's where they're headed to right now, so thanks for doing that as well. Well, the next couple that we want to share is Jason and Barbara, and I want to tell you something. What you're going to see right now before your very eyes is a miracle. 
because Jason was in an accident that they said he would never walk again. So let's welcome them and give the Lord the glory. Are you stable? You good? Okay. In March of this year, we went on a family camping trip. When we got out to our camp spot at the dry lake bed, there was a gentleman out there with his hand rail. Jason decided to go for a ride with him. In less than 10 minutes, I started seeing sirens. And I ran to the sirens and had CHP come up to me and tell me that they lost control and flipped twice. Jason was ejected out of it. And a helicopter landed. So we get to the hospital, and he doesn't look good. And I'm, I can't listen to the doctors because all of them are talking negatively, and I just know he's going to make it, and they're saying he's not. And I just know Jason's going to make it. And Jason's here. We've had to reteach him how to walk, to use the bathroom, to feed himself. Um, the accident gave him a severe traumatic brain injury, so he's confused and he doesn't have a very good memory. But he's here. In September, we had to take Jason to the hospital because he had a massively large blood clot in his leg from his growing area down below his knee. And he was in the hospital for a week. And one month later, I took him to the doctor so we could figure out what we were going to do about it. And it was gone. And I just, you know, the night of the accident, God already had known. And he put his angels where they needed to be. Because in the middle of the dry lake bed in Joshua Tree, in some brush, is a paramedic from Santa Monica camping in a tent that sees it all happen and rushes to Jason and calls 911. And it, it, God just had his hands all over all of this. And I know Jason will be back 100%. <laughs> Faith in God that Jesus will be back a hundred percent. Um I just right now I would like to thank the Lord for looking after me. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, let's all gather around, lay our hands on Jason, thank the Lord for the miracles that he has done, and pray for a total and complete healing for Jason. Thank you. Lord Jesus, in the book of James, you instruct us that we should have the sick come and the elders should anoint him with oil and a prayer of faith. And so that's what we do right now. We pray for Jason. We thank you for the miracles. Not only did he live, not only did you restore his walking, not only did you take away that massive blood clot, but Lord, we believe that you're not through doing the miracles in his life. We pray for your restoration to be upon him in every way. We, we pray for this brain concussion. We pray for a total healing. We pray, Lord, for his emotions, his physical well-being. Lord, that you would do a work greater than what any of them in the family could dream or imagine. We pray, Lord, that you would meet every need that they have now. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. All right, let's give him a hand.
Well, our next family that's going to share, again, just having them come up on stage is a miracle. So we'll have Dallas and Deidre and little Levi, who is a miracle that he is alive. So let's welcome him right now. Here's your microphone, Levi. All right, so um, five years ago, God blessed us with Levi, and when he was born, he had a stroke. Um, they told us that he would never walk or talk. Um, when he was two, they said he would, may have a 25% understandable speech um, for people that did know him. And about two years ago, Levi started speaking. Um, <laughs> He speaks very well now, and he um, says he would like to be a pastor and a fireman. About a month ago, he wasn't feeling well. I took him to the doctor. It was really cold in the doctor's office, so I said, Levi, sit right here. I'm going to grab a jacket. I ran out to the car, and I came back in, and the whole lobby was quiet except for one lady that was sitting there crying. And I said, oh, goodness, what did he do? And I walked over and I said, are you okay? And she said, yeah, you have an angel here on earth. And I said, okay. And she said, I broke my finger. And he asked if he could lay hands on me and pray for me. And that's what he was doing. He had his hand on her shoulder and was praying that God would be with her and take her pain and heal her. And, and um, he does that quite often. Um, I also prayed and prayed because he had to start school this year and I was afraid to send him to public school and I wanted him to go here to Joshua Springs and that wasn't answered and I was really upset at first and then about a month ago because I continued to pray about it I figured out that the reason he's not at Joshua Springs is he packs his little baby Bible every day and goes to school and tells me, Mom, I'm going to go tell the kids that don't know about God how to get him in their heart. And he actually has his best friend here with him, and he, we were driving one day, and he says, um, I'm going to teach you how to pray. You just close your eyes, and when you do, you'll see God's world. And then you just talk to him. It's that simple, and he'll listen to you, and he'll answer your prayers. And Levi wants to pray tonight. Do you want to pray still? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. This, Lord, this. Thank you for this church. Lord, we just praise you and this. Thank you, Lord. Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, let's come up and lay hands on little Levi. You know, Levi was a priest. In the Old Testament, the tribe of Levi is the ones that uh, led. And I was sharing, Samuel was called at a young age. It's not a, an unusual thing to be called at a young age. So we're going to pray, and we're going to anoint not only Levi, but his friend as well. All right? <laughs> there we go. Lord, we anoint Levi with oil. What's your name? Benny. Benny. All right. Lord, we thank you. And we thank you for the testimony of a child that was not supposed to be able to communicate. But Lord, you've not only given him the ability to communicate, but you've given him a wonderful message as well. So Lord, we pray that you would bless this family more than what they could ever dream or imagine. We thank you, Lord, for Levi's love for you, his desire to grow in you. We pray that that would just continue in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Tonight we have one more. I've asked Grumpy to come up and share as well. And again with Grumpy, he was not expected to live. And uh, actually there, there came a time where I met Peggy, his wife, 
out in front of the church office and had a very difficult conversation with her because Grumpy was in the hospital. The prognosis was almost no hope and had to have a conversation with Peggy about the possibility of having to make the decision of pulling the plug. And we prayed for Grumpy that day. We prayed that God would do a miracle. And you know what? We have a miracle. All right? Let's give Grumpy a hand. When, uh, well, let me just give you a little history of what happened. I came into work on May 20th, 2011, and I went into Fem's office because I wasn't feeling well. As the day went on, I felt even worse, and about noontime, I had asked Israel to take me down to the desert hospital. We didn't even make it out of the driveway, and they had me... They had to call the ambulance to get me over to the hospital. They brought me to High Desert, and I was there for two day, for two days. I remember about two hours of it because I went into a coma, and I pretty much stayed that way for four weeks. Um, in Hebrews four sixteen, it tells us, "Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace." to help in the time of our needs. Well, I, uh, I've received more grace and more mercy from God than anybody could ever imagine, and I don't deserve one little bit of it. I, uh, my pancreas had quit, and when my pancreas quit, my kidneys quit, my liver quit, I went into septic shock, and I had a heart attack all within the first 48 hours. Um... When they transported me down to the desert, they didn't think I was going to make it through the ambulance ride. I made it to desert. The doctors would give me a less than 10% chance to live. Um, Pastor Gerald was leaving three days later for Africa, and that's a big undertaking, but he was at the hospital with my wife right up until the time he left. Um, I don't remember a whole lot. I went into septic shock, and they have this machine. I always mess up the name of it, but it's uh, plasma synthesis or something. It takes blood out of one side of your body, runs it through the machine, and puts it back into the other. Um, as things went on, the day Pastor Gerald talked about my wife, went down to the hospital and Sherry Geisinger went with her and when they walked in and I thanked the Lord every day that I had Christian doctors the doctors met my wife and they said there's no more we can do it's totally in God's hands but we're going to give it a little bit of time before we ask you to pull the plug I thank God that he did intervene because here I am today but the doctors also told my wife, if I made it, my liver would not be working properly. I'd be on dialysis the rest of my life. And uh, I'm glad to say my liver is back at 95%. My kidneys are at 90. I still don't have a pancreas, but there's a little thing called an insulin pump that takes care of that. So... What we have to be thankful for is God's mercy and God's grace. None of us really deserve it. And I can tell you, I especially don't. But in Ephesians, in Ephesians 2, 4 to 9, it tells us about God being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By Christ you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show you the immeasurable riches of his grace and in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For my grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works. No one, so that no one may boast. 
And when I was on that photo, I mean that plasma whatever machine that I can never pronounce, they sent down um, Pastor Gerald and Craig and Fem put together a, a CD of worship songs that played in my room constantly. And I was on this machine for five days that was cleaning my blood. And my wife never shared this with me until Friday. We do a, we do our annual prayer breakfast here. And one of the songs that Craig and Aaron uh, chose was I Have a Hope. And my wife said when I was on the machine for 24 hours a day, she locked the CD player. So this was the only song it would play. And I'd like to share the words with you because that was probably the darkest time of her life. And uh, she held on to hope. And it goes, I have a hope. I have a future. I have a destiny that is awaiting me. My life is not over. A new beginning's just begun. I have a hope. I have this hope. God has a plan, and it's not to harm me. But it's to prosper me and to hear me when I call. He intercedes for me working all things for my good. Through trials may come, I have this hope. I will yet praise him, my great Redeemer. I will yet stand up and give him glory with my life. He takes my darkness and he turns it into light. I will yet praise him, my Lord, my God. My God is for me, he's not against me. So tell me who then, Tell me whom then shall I fear. He has prepared me great works. He'll help me to complete. I have a hope. I have this hope. Goodness and mercy, they're going to follow me. And I'll forever dwell in the house of my great king. No eye has ever seen all he's preparing there for me. Though trials may come, I have this hope. There's still hope for me today because the God of heaven loves me. And I don't, everybody has something to be thankful for, but we all have one thing to be thankful for, and that's God's grace and God's mercy. Thank you. Such a blessing. I, I don't think everyone knows what he does. He is a sheriff's chaplain, which means he gets called out to any situation where a chaplain would be needed besides the regular ride-alongs and going out to uh, the sheriff's station. He also has done something at reaching out in our community. He does the barbecue ministry for the fire department, the town, the water district, and all across this basin here, helping lots and lots of other people. Well, one of the things that he's taken on in the last couple of years, which is absolutely phenomenal. For years in our community, we had a guy by the name of Bob Burke. And Bob Burke put together uh, the community prayer ev uh, event, which was absolutely one of the most fantastic things that this community does. And uh, anyway... Bob Burke has gone home to be with the Lord. Grumpy has now taken it on with that very same heart. We just had it last week. It was absolutely a phenomenal success. So thank you, Grumpy, very, very much. So, And then one last thing before I share the word a little bit. Uh, we want to pray for Alan Pizzuto. And he's in the hospital. Uh, he, they found that he had kidney cancer. And fortunately, it hadn't spread outside the kidney. He had uh, had the kid kidney removed, was doing very well. Uh, he's run into some complications. And so, Cindy and Finn, why don't you guys come up? We're going to lay hands on you uh, for your dad, Cindy. And uh, let's pray for God's miraculous hand. Also, Cindy's grandma, right before church uh, or this afternoon, had a terrible fall and uh, broke out some teeth, and it, it has been very painful, and her nose, and she's such a dear saint and always here. So let's come up and lay hands on Fim and Cindy as we pray for Alan and Lucille.
Lord, we thank you so much for Alan and the blessing that he is. We, we pray, Lord, we're not sure what's happening right now, but you are. And we thank you that you are the great physician. We thank you that they were able to, to take this kidney. And Lord, that the cancer had not grown outside of it. We pray about these complications, whatever's going on, that you would just touch and heal completely and raise him up. Uh, I know, Lord, he was looking forward to coming home uh, right away. But we just pray, Lord, that your miracle hand would be upon him. We thank you tonight that in all the incidences where the doctors said one thing, you did another. And so we pray for this complete healing. We pray for Lucille as well. We love her and ask your hand to be upon her. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. I want to share just a, a short scripture tonight, and then we're going to have an extended time of worship and communion. There are certain verses out of the Bible that for me have become life verses, which means that at a time in my life where I just needed a true living word from the Lord, this scripture ministered life. And then many other times in my life, I would go back to it. And it's out of Philippians chapter 4, verse number 4, and it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Not, not just when everything's going well. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. My friends, so often in our life, anxiety and worry destroy our peace. It's interesting. Anxiety, it literally means to be pulled apart. In the, in the ancient English language, the word for anxiety was strangle. And, and that's what anxiety does in our lives. And that's why there is a principle here here. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all people because the Lord is at hand. We have to keep in mind what is really going on, where we are in life and how long we're here and what's really important. And then he says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. You see, my friends, God has never called us just to have a day of thanksgiving. He's called us to live a life of thanksgiving. And as we do that, then we can have a peace that surpasses from understanding. Because there's going to be times in our lives where we do not understand what's going on. And the pain in our life may be so great... We don't have a simple solution. But that's why it's a peace that surpasses understanding. Now, my friends, the context of why this was written was two people weren't getting along. Two women in the church who had both served the Lord were now getting along. And we all know something. There's nothing that robs our joy faster than having conflict in our lives. And this is what Paul does. Now, you know what's interesting about this? Paul never even deals with a conflict. We have no idea what it was. And he didn't say who was right or who was wrong. You know what he did? He pointed to the Lord being at hand. And in the whole scheme of all of eternity, what's important, what's not important. And then he says this, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, 
Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And the things which you learned and received and heard in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So the message for us at this Thanksgiving, and as we get ready to partake in communion, you see, communion is something that is designed to remind us. These pieces of matzos, they were all one at one point. But this matzos was broken. Symbolic of Jesus' blood, a body being broken for us. When we partake of the cup... It's not by accident that the cup is red. Because our salvation was paid for at a tremendous price. And so Paul reminds us in this rejoice in the Lord always and always having a heart of thanksgiving. How can we do that? Because we're all sinners. Every single one of us have been saved by exactly the same thing, the broken body of Jesus Christ. And as we take these principles into our life, it will change our life. And it will give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. So how do we do it? Rejoice in the Lord always. In case we forget it, again I say, rejoice. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which what? Surpasses all understanding, doesn't just come from understanding, shall guard your hearts and mind. So for the rest of the evening, we're going to have just a time of worship. So you have plenty of time. At whatever point you want to take communion, you're free to come up and partake in communion. But we have lots of time and we've designed this evening. Just have a time where you could spend with the Lord. If you want to get your children and bring them over and celebrate in a family communion, you can do that as well. There'll be plenty of time. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you as we look at this red cup and this broken body. Lord, we are reminded at the tremendous price. We're reminded of the whole purpose and with all of eternity in view, what's important and what's not important. And so, Lord, we pray that you would do that work in our hearts and lives now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.